Hello and welcome to this lecture video on Jay Kristoff's Empire of the Vampire. My name is Annika Kloser and I hope that you have all read EOTV by now because I am not able to avoid spoilers so this was your last and only warning. In this video we will talk about, and this is of course an obvious choice, intermediality and intertextuality. Why is it useful to talk about them in this context? We will also talk about the Gothic, specifically elements of Lovecraftian horror and notions of monstrosity. And lastly, we will take a look at the depiction of religion, how it ties into the Gothic, and also which role fanaticism plays in Empire of the Vampire. So, starting off with intermediality, a term most of you should be familiar with by now. According to the Handbook of Intermediality, media always exist in relationship with one another and are not disconnected or isolated. As Gabriele Rippel puts it here, the term intermediality refers to the relationship between media and is hence used to describe a huge range of cultural phenomena which involve more than one medium. Since so many disciplines such as literature, art and theatre studies work together, one cohesive and universal definition is hard to come by. What is important to remember though is that intermediality usually crosses or blurs the boundaries of a medium. When we take Christoph's Empire of the Vampire as our example, you will see that illustrations as a visual art form engage closely with the medium of the novel and its written words. Christoph writes, he realized the cold blood wasn't only writing down his every word, he was also sketching, using that prenatural speed to trace a few lines between every breath. Gabriel saw the lines coalescing into an image now, a man in three-quarter profile. You might be familiar with Marshall McLuhan's Understanding Media, The Extensions of Men, in which he coined the phrase, the medium is the message. While there's definitely a lot of potential to argue over this, it is certainly true that every medium brings a unique quality to, let's say, an adaptation of a book, for example. If we were to adapt EOTV into a stage play, a radio play, a film or a TV series, each medium would have its own specificities, advantages and disadvantages. We can definitely argue that the illustrations inside the novel are a form of adaptation, as they visualize the written words for the reader. But it is of course also a form of intermediality. Meaning in this novel is not only generated by interpreting words, but also by means of the illustrations. If we were to imagine this novel without them, the novel's meanings would be expressed differently, especially because the reader's perception is necessarily influenced by them. After all, the illustrator holds great power over how the reader experiences the story and characters as well. The vampires would certainly hold less appeal if A, the implied illustrator wouldn't be a vampire himself, and B, they were, in a more general sense, drawn in a form that is commonly deemed unattractive to the western eye. If Gabriel were to illustrate his own life, I would argue that the monsters he so despises would be depicted differently. And, as a homodiegetic artist, the illustration of Jean-Francois are able to manipulate our point of focus, our sympathies and our perception. Before we jump into the gothic dimensions of EOTV, I would like to bring your attention to a few fun intertextual references. After all, depending on your own point of view, intertextuality can be perceived as a form of intermediality. If a text references a piece of music, an intermedial and intertextual reference is made. The point is, there is no clear-cut difference between intermediality and intertextuality. Depending on your own knowledge of popular culture, you might have noticed various intertextual references to other works in Empire of the Vampire, such as Lainey Taylor's Strange the Dreamer or V.E. Schwab's A Darker Shade of Magic. Sarai, a character from Taylor whose soul is represented through hundreds of moths, is referenced here in the description of Aaron's tattoos. Sarai, the angel of plagues, filled his biceps, her beautiful moth wings spread white. Our second example references Schwab's protagonist Kel, who owns a magic coat that has not one or two sides, but several. Furthermore, he is able to travel between four different versions of London, as is alluded to by Christoph. Oh, the coat wouldn't stop an enchanted blade or let me walk across worlds or anything impressive enough for poor Belle to write a song about. These are only two examples, but there are various others I'm sure I didn't catch. Should you discover anything fun, let us know on the appropriate platforms. <laughs> 
Moving on to the Gothic, you might wonder why I want to talk about the Gothic here. EOTV is shelved as fantasy after all. However, I would like to bring your attention to the various Gothic or even horror undertones, elements and tropes within the narrative. Gothic as a mode is quite ubiquitous. While American, European or Australian Gothic traditions may differ from each other and tackle different themes and fears, the Gothic in general can be found in various forms of media, including novels, TV programs, cinema and games. Everyone is probably familiar with Shelley's Frankenstein or Stoker's Dracula, but recent examples outside of literature also include Resident Evil 8, Village or Demon Souls. As these games show, the gothic permeates into different genres, mostly horror, but also fantasy and sci-fi. As Justin D. Edwards puts it, the gothic never dies, it just morphs into different forms at different historical moments. The reason I will be mentioning the European, but also especially the American gothic here, is because the American gothic has arguably had the greatest influence on gothic literature. Take for example Edgar Allan Poe, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Stephen King or H.P. Lovecraft, who will be of great importance here. Central themes like madness, race and also cosmic threats that are often deemed Lovecraftian can certainly be pinned down in EOTV, even though you certainly might find distinctly Australian elements after watching Dr. Katrin Altan's lecture on Gothic Down Under. The subgenre within the horror and gothic that best fits Empire of the Vampire is often known as cosmic horror or Lovecraftian horror. Throughout this talk, I will refer to it as Lovecraftian horror only, but know that there's another term for it. The subgenre often plays with the ideas of helplessness and of humanity at the mercy of something larger, something sublime and extraterrestrial that is outside of human imagination or even comprehension. In Lovecraft's opinion, Lovecraftian horror is the best form of the Gothic because it offers no explanation and presents itself as an invincible force. This departs from other Gothic texts in it that it cannot be solved and simply implies the fallibility of the sense of ordered stability that the Gothic so often promotes. What this can be related to in EOTV is obviously the vampires, but also the horrors Gabe and the others encounter in Book 4, Chapter 12, Old Monarch's New Sovereigns. The creatures Gabriel and his companions encounter in the Forest of Sorrows are very reminiscent of Lovecraft's eldritch abominations. The examples include spiders with human hands, trees with faces and birds with tongues for feathers. Especially the stag that is mentioned here evokes great terror. The left side of the beast's body was covered in pale growths, pustules slinked by a lattice of coabs. Its left eye bulged from its socket, bloated with what might have been blood. The stag shivered, gore spilling from the quarrel in its neck. Rearing up on its hind legs, it threw back its head and screamed. But as its mouth opened wider and wider, it split apart, entirely, chin and jaw, and holy god, even its throat unfurling like the petals of some awful flower to form a horrid, tooth-filled maw, and its scream. Its scream was a little girl's, a human girl's. While this monster is not shown to be invincible, no greater explanation for its existence is offered except for the blight. It is said to have come with day's death and therefore also with the vampires. The fungi corrupt animals and plants, or, and I quote, all that was once green and good. Even though the blight certainly ties into the Lovecraftian horror elements, maybe this would also pose a nice topic for a blog post about eco-criticism, but that is up to you. Leaving the Lovecraftian horror behind, we are now moving on to another pressing theme in Empire of the Vampire, and that is the question of monstrosity, or the division between the familiar self and monstrous other. Popular examples are of course Violet from American Horror Story, Murder House, or in literature the frequently referred to Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which also play heavily on the Gothic. Such texts ask, as Edward puts it, pressing questions about political rights and the relations between sentient beings. What beings should be feared? Who should be cared of? Who should be restrained or locked up? This question also arises in Empire of the Vampire, as Gabriel himself is locked up by Empress Chastain for being a murderer and slayer of the Forever King. And still he is provided for until his life story has been recorded. The question of monstrosity is brought to our attention fairly early in the book on page 45, as Jean-Francois, revolted by Gabe's story, exclaims, and you name us monsters, which already sets up one of the central tensions in the novel, 
Furthermore, Sersha calls the pale bloods monsters who wear the skins of men. Hybridized binaries such as half alive, half dead, obscurely, obviously, repellent, spectre or creature also come into play here. Vampires such as Lor Vos are first described to be of astonishing beauty, but then monstrous and repellent. She was hideous, she was evil incarnate, but God help me, she was beautiful and dark as the end of all days. Gabriel as a pale blood also moves in between the categories of human and monster, making him both half alive and half dead. We can see these boundaries between self and other gradually dissolve as Gabriel's hunger grows worse and he begins behaving like the monsters he so despises. The divided self, a division between head and heart or body, as it is presented here, is not only a nod to Cartesian dualism, but also a central motive within Gothic fiction. The usual protagonist is motivated by unconscious desires and irrational impulses such as Gabriel's lust for blood. I would argue that his condition falls very much in line with the Gothic conventions, since his addiction to Sanctus and his growing hunger become a contest for control. We should definitely be critical of the distinction between vampires and humanity and question why and how the narrative evokes hostility towards vampires. They have, after all, no say in what they eat, while the palebloods can very well choose, even though their hunger might grow. Furthermore, we experience the plot through Gabriel's eyes, so the first-person narration might be unreliable or influence the reader more easily. Despite Gabriel's insistence of a vampire's lack of compassion, Jean-Francois starts crying after Gabriel's revelation about his family's demise. Even the Forever King seeks vengeance for his dead daughter, which indicates they aren't only the cold-blooded monsters Gabriel resents. In contrast to that, communities like the ones at saint Michon or the Inquisitors show monstrous behaviors that don't necessarily differ from the vampires, despite them being half or even fully human. This falls into another category of the Gothic, namely of generating terror by playing on anxieties about boundaries of the self that extend to boundaries of the family, community and nation. In addition to that, the boundary is equally broken down by Celine, Gabriel's sister, who is now a vampire herself. These factors all line up to showcase how the self, which is threatened by an other, is revealed to be, at least in parts, the other itself. This is why the difference between vampires and pale bloods, or humans, isn't as clear-cut as it's made out to be. I would even argue that we can easily regard humanity as monstrous and that it's a matter of narrative perspective, one supported by the intermediality of the text, but also by the horrifying acts taken by humanity, such as those connected to the religious orders prominent in EOTV. The Gothic mode is of course tied to the central topic of religion. Fantasy and religion usually go hand in hand, and relation to Christianity and Christoph's work is undeniable and easily recognizable. These religious connections to the Gothic further bolster the monstrosity of the self and of humanity that is presented in EOTV. As a brief aside that might be of interest to you, J. Christoph mentioned that he took a lot of inspiration from Cologne Cathedral, as well as other fixtures of Gothic architecture, so the frequent religious settings like abbeys, monasteries and cathedrals that are usually attributed to European Gothic are certainly not a surprise in the novel. To start this off, I would like to talk about the monastery San Michio. According to the Glossary of the Gothic, monasteries are among the most fruitful settings for violent Gothic horror, which is why the subgenre has been coined monastic shocker by William White Watt. While we might not be dealing with the typical crypts, tunnels and cellars, we do have a congregation of nuns of the Silver Priory, death rites and of course a cathedral. Early on, San Michon evokes a feeling of isolation and loneliness, especially when Gabriel is still trying to find his place among the Silver Saints. But we obviously not only have religious motives in EOTV, but we also deal with the question of faith itself. The prologue already sets up this conflict by bringing up the often discussed theodicy question. If he's both willing and able to put pay to it all, how can this evil exist in the first place? Even though the novel does openly question a higher power's intent, it is far from settled on the matters on religion and faith. This is most evident in how religious faith is depicted in the confrontation between Rafa and Danton Voss during their battle at the monastery. The priest's faith starts to waver without the glowing wheel, for he starts to question whether his god's power is enough to keep him from death, or if he is even willing to save him. 
When Ruffer's faith ultimately fails, it is because he overinvests in the symbols of his faith, rather than its greater power. In this way, it might seem to gesture toward a faith detached from organization. What is, however, criticized in Empire of the Vampire is the blind faith that never questions. The cruelty conducted at San Michon, such as the Red Rite, the beating of Astrid, and the treatment of Aaron and Baptiste, go back to a vigorous religious belief that is openly contested throughout the narrative. The best example in that regard is Sister Chloe, who believes in divine providence, but ultimately fails to recognize the radically heretical extremism and its terrible consequences. She is willing to sacrifice an innocent teenager that views her as a mother figure and feels little to no remorse in a need parallel to Abraham's attempt to sacrifice Isaac in the Old Testament. But coming back to the question of monstrosity, it seems ironic that Jean-Francois, of all people, wants the reader with his comments about her intent first by remarking that she sounds, and I quote, positively unbalanced and deranged. Gabriel, however, counters, Chloe Sauvage was no lunatic. She was something twice as dangerous, something I was too back then, but will never be again. The various hints left throughout the story come to fruition when Dior is about to be sacrificed and Gabriel acknowledges for the first time that the Silver Saints themselves are monstrous and no longer fulfilling their purpose. Blind faith and fanaticism have made them just as monstrous as Gabriel's enemies by conducting senseless murders in the name of a higher being. It's for the good love, she whispered, it's God's will. All on earth below and heaven above is the work of his hand. Gabriel's choice to rescue Dior and disregard God's alleged plan only illustrates how the novel does not criticize the foundations of faith, but merely the violence conducted in its name. If this topic is of interest to you, you could also write a paper or blog post about the depiction of religion in Empire of the Vampire and compare it to another fantasy, Australian or otherwise. Examples include Pullman's His Dark Materials, or if you want to work with Polar Opposites, Lewis's The Chronicles of Narnia. So before we wrap this up, I have listed a few ideas that we didn't touch upon that would also be very interesting for a blog post or term paper. You might want to think about the representation of queer characters and relationships, but also how gender conventions are confirmed or subverted. If you are interested in fantasy and its map conventions, having a closer look at the map in Empire of the Vampire might be worthwhile. Of course, I have already mentioned eco-criticism very briefly, but there is definitely more to be said on it, and maybe even with the notions of colonialism this book provides. After all, the threat of a race of pale killers, an empire no less, invading the country might not be entirely by chance, especially when considering an Australian context. Lastly, here are the sources that I used and you might also want to have a look at if you choose to work further with Empire of the Vampire. I hope you enjoyed the session and I hope you have fun with the rest of the course.